echo through. And then do we want to start right away too? Um, let's just give it one second to kind of get connected. Okay, I think we're good now. Do we want to give some people more time to join or you want to start right away? Um, let's go. I, I see a bunch of people just join the YouTube. Um, so we could give it another minute or two, but I think we could also just kind of dive in. Okay. And then do we want Katie to share her slide now? Is that the... Yes, go ahead and share. I have the... There we go. Do you see that? Yeah. Do you guys see this black box if I move it? If you no. like anything in front of, okay. There's like a weird microphone icon for me. I'm just gonna put it down here. Okay. Now we don't see it. Okay, cool. This... All right, so welcome everybody. Welcome to the Lawrence Technological University College of Architecture and Design's lecture series. We're joined by Katie Newell this evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce her. It's often the case that we have the opportunity to invite people from outside the college to come and share their work. And we often try and find people who can talk to many of the different disciplines in the College of Architecture and Design. And you can see on this slide right now, the degrees that are offered within the college. Um, we didn't actually think about how many years ago we met Katie, but we were talking about how that happened. But it's my pleasure to introduce Katie. Uh, Katie was supposed to have lectured last year in March, and then the lecture series and school and everything moved and everything changed. And so it's nice that she's able to join us. I was going to jokingly suggest that she wanted her lecture to come after the change in daylight savings so that it would be actually dark out when she lectured, which is a big part of her work. Um, but it's a, it's a pleasure to have Katie join us. I think her work, as you guys will see, her work spans um, a deep understanding uh, and investigation in, in making, but also tied to the place that she's that she's working in and those places vary considerably um, katie's background she has uh, her undergraduate degree is from georgia tech and she did her master's degree at rice she's won numerous numerous awards and some of that was shared in the bio that was sent around she uh, won the young architects prize to the architecture league of new york uh, she's a fellow of the American Academy in Rome. She was, I have, a, I have other things open on my screen. She was um, in 2011, um, the art prize in Grand Rapids. She's also exhibited at the Venice Biennale and she's a Kresge artist fellow and a Lucas fellow. Um, her, her work, um, well, I guess I've, I've followed Katie's work for a while. We've we taught together for a number of years. She's tenured at the University of Michigan and she's also the director of the uh, graduate degree there, which is now called the Masters of Science in Digital and Material Technology. Um, and so it's been, it's, it's fun and exciting to have her here. I think other things about Katie, she's a runner, she's a pilot, and she has a really great giggle, which maybe we'll also get a sense for tonight. And so it's fun to be able to embarrass her a little bit. Um, but I've been, it's, it's been amazing to see her work evolve. Um, I know that she's not working today, but it wouldn't be uncommon to ask her to raise her hands and to see her hands covered in something like black all over her hands, whether it be any type of material that she's working on. Um, and as I said, she's a maker and she's thinking about how things are made and why things are made and, and what materials are used. Um, and I, I, I was trying to remember too, I think the title for your lecture tonight 
was maybe a little bit of a joke. What should we call it? <laughs> and I think Katie does have, uh, as, as is a kind of growing um, maybe issue within our discipline. I think Katie's work is very difficult to communicate if you don't see it in person. I think there's also, or often a sensory component to it in terms of how it smells or what kind of sensation it gives you when you're seeing it. And so um, she's been working in, in terms of how to document that. And I think other times it's just impossible to document some of those things. It's, it's both ephemeral um, and incredibly lasting in terms of the kind of beauty that you're left with when you see her work. Um, so I could keep talking about it, but Katie will do a much better job. So why don't you take it away, Katie? It's, it's a pleasure to be able to catch up with you today and it's great to have you uh, sharing your work with us. Wonderful, thanks Thanks so much for having me. It's so lovely to see a lot of you, even though we're, we're only virtual. I'll, I'll be sure to mute every time that I'm about to laugh, but um, I, have, I have brought up the title title slide here, darkness materials and other unphotographable things. And it, it truly did fall out of a, a very quick joking conversation um, with much gratitude to Carl. Um, when, I, when he asked me to lecture, I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? And I, I think funny enough, in just a quick message back, darkness materials and other unphotographable things became actually became quite clear as a, as a quick summary to the work that I've been doing, because it, it really does um, it really does sort of capture the way I work and, and maybe even some of the, as Carl was mentioning so generously, the difficulty in sort of documenting or presenting that, or, or maybe even the, the inability to draw the things that I'm interested in and therefore it does either turn into making it or um, even photographs or unsuccessful photographs as being a way to kind of research that work. So a huge thank you for the, the invitation and the title. Um, and, and maybe I'll just even start flashing through a couple images of the work as I set it up a little bit more. I think um, it's very clear, maybe with some of the hints that Carl's already given in terms of an interest in, in things like darkness. And I think for me, there's a strong interest in the kind of optical effects that are in a place and sort of how that also pairs with maybe strong meanings and really understanding a particular place and its time. Um, and as I mentioned before, I think these are often things that are not easy to capture maybe in drawing, maybe in photograph, or maybe easy to not capture unless you're actually there. So um, the work I end up producing can range in so many ways from different forms or scales or approaches. Um, as was mentioned already, I think there's always kind of a sort of deep tie to what might be the site at that time. And, and site for me usually guides what is a, a material choice and a process choice, and maybe even a question about uh, the duration that a project um, is, is going to last. Um, and one consistent ambition that comes through that is um, thinking about that place and time having to do a lot with things like day and night or what might be the particular lighting at that time. And I guess there is that sort of ephemeral quality that comes through in the work Wanting, wanting the the project and the materials, but also anyone who's viewing it to, to understand that their relationship to the work or their experience of the work is actually happening um, because, of, because of when they're there. So things like the weather or the time of day might matter or what just happened in current events becomes really important actually to somebody's kind of experience of that, that particular place and the things that were done in it. Um, so for me, the work can really be very literal or optical or accidental. Um, a lot of things happen uh, where a project, I can speak of it as ghosting, and I'll get into a few of those well, as well. Really looking maybe towards the difference of something's kind of physical presence versus some of the other presence that we can think of. So I've been already showing, showing kind of a snippet of things as, as I introduce here, but um, so today I'll show things that range from installation work as well as some material research. And then um, the work of Alibi Studio is at a, at a moment where it is shifting up to larger scales and really thinking about uh, how some of this can move to either buildings or in a way kind of tending to buildings that happen to be uh, basically in ways in my life right now or things like that. So I'll be I'll be speaking to some some larger works, including one that is um, especially even with this pandemic times very much so in the works and very much so kind of changing constantly. So I'll actually begin with this one, though, which seems um, 
Carl's discussion of when we met, it was 11 years ago. <laughs> um, and this is actually one of the first projects that I would have would have done as I um, returned to Michigan after being in a few other places, um, meaning returning to the state of Michigan. And this project, this project's called Weatherizing. And maybe just to kind of give it a simple definition of what it is, it was a, I had an interest in trying to figure out how to um, capture a very dark space. So this is a, it was a abandoned garage in, in Detroit, kind of a set off from the back of a house that was also no longer being used. And I was really keyed into the interest of thinking about at that time that um, with a lot of windows boarding up spaces that a lot of places could actually be seen as these very, very dark volumes that were throughout the city. And there was an interest to kind of think about, and in a way kind of even just uh, savor that sort of optical presence of a condition that we actually don't often allow ourselves. So the, the project of weatherizing took an interest in how to consider and kind of reconsider apertures that are in our spaces or quite literally windows. And, and the project really looked to uh, create something out of what used to be, you know, flat pane windows, uh, but that instead actually kind of volumize the project, volumize the window to become to become more of a space and to allow this relationship between whatever light can sort of leak in to also be um, a kind of glow or a condition that uh, spatialized the window. And so it actually started, um, what's, what is common to my practice is maybe to just start with some material test until something feels like it resonates with some of the interests at play. And so at that time I had already been working with glass and I'll mention this a couple of times through, but I really actually just uh, simply pierced the, the side wall of the house with a extruded glass rod. And of course, one can think of it very easily in hindsight, but it worked like a giant optical fiber. And for me, this became a really interesting moment to think through windows and even boarded up windows, which are usually considered to be part of um, kind of, you know, how secure something is, or if it's even, um, you know, privacy levels. And this became an interest for me to think through, like, how can I actually turn this into being the consideration of the window for that space? This sort of jumps then into the aggregation of that. So what I started to do inside the garage that I mentioned before was to slowly expand out uh, these glass tubes in places that were actually pretty key to the space. So if you back out and see it a little bit, you'll see that these, these are now quite a lot of pieces. The actual bundle of all of these, um, all of these tubes, if you took them in cross-section, it's the same amount of cross-section that would have been the original window in this garage, but in essence has now been uh, spread out across the entirety of the space. Or I should say more carefully that it's spread out in terms of um, key areas. So the line here in the bottom, I don't actually know, can you guys see my little hand that's pointing? So this actually lines up with their, where the original window was, which is right here. And then it traces towards things like the door swing, the peak of the roof. And then over here, actually, there's an intermingling. It's hard to know from the inside, but it's actually intermingling with a tree that's out here and how those, um, how those branches are growing. So I was interested in trying to see how can that flat pane window become volumized throughout the space and how can there be a kind of careful register between the amount of light that I'm now letting in and still maintaining that, that dark volume that in a way can be seen as sort of very fragile. Um, and so this is, of course, you can see from the door swing, this is a moment of, of daylight uh, and all of the illumination, of course, is the, the daylight coming through uh, those long extensions of glass. And what's important to also note is that I was interested in trying to figure out how this effect could be taken to the nighttime as well. So it's a bit hard to see in this nighttime photo, but there's actually little tiny solar panels that were on this roof as well that were of course gaining their energy by day. And then at night with lights embedded into that wall thickness of the garage, um, the same tubes would glow back out um, at nighttime. And so that condition of day to night. And I, I think it's important to mention that the project there was an interest for it to be remaining off the grid as well. The, the house that it was being worked with was no longer attached to the electrical grid in the city. And I had an interest in it also being um, something where its kind of sources of illumination were entirely based on what was surrounding it. And if you look into detail here on um, for that project, you can see that the, the tubes were bent and flared. And that, that came out of an interest in kind of relating to the window as well. Um, it was more of just kind of a hunch and an investigation to go on with the project where 
the idea was, and with this being called weatherizing, the idea also was that with these tubes and different orientations, they would, um, different ones would maybe catch the wind or, you know, maybe just one of them could perhaps catch a raindrop based on where that was coming from. But you'll also see this kind of sharp shadow lines that were happening. Um, I think I have an image that shows it even better where um, at certain times of the day, the brightness of the sun, it was actually hard to register the glass tubes, but instead you were seeing the sort of shadow and the drawing. And again, it returns to the edge where the original window was. And you can see the kind of um, hiding of that here. And then also just the, the relationship to things like the peak of the house and the, the kind of insistent on that. And here again is just showing a little bit of the of the detailing, which really would kind of capture up. Um, Carl had mentioned sort of some of the other sensory additions to some of the projects, but you could hear. Um, unfortunately, I don't have audio for it, but you could hear, you know, sort of a wind kind of whistling condition based on the presumption that maybe one of these at different times would be aligned to the wind that was coming in. And then this shows you the kind of night effect. I very much so, and maybe the unphotographable or the photograph photographing um, approach, I, I do like to study the work that I do in photograph, often realizing that, and this happens throughout the project, but I find that I learn so much and a lot of times it kind of also starts to prepare the thinking for a next project. And so this one, as a way to capture the whole story too, this is a nighttime photo that's of course giving you that kind of occupation, the sense of occupation of someone being in it, there's no way to sort of see what's going in there. So the privacy still remains. And then in the back, you can see the electrical lines that are, of course, um, not attached to this building and being off the grid uh, with the sky that night happening, happening, happening to be the same sort of um, strange color that's coming out from the illumination within as well. And this project actually then ended up getting a, a kind of different life. Um, I should mention that the work that I did, it was, I did the work in the garage. I had also mentioned it was part of a house where there was um, four other uh, designers at the time working on that house as well. And the, that house and kind of the, the effort of us doing different experiments on it was, was asked to be part of the Venice Biennale and this is in 2012. And so the, the simple request had actually been, can we bring that project or sort of the thinking of that project to Venice. And, and for me, actually, I, I took that statement really seriously for a while to think through. And I kept thinking like, how, how can I bring something that's in essence about this captured volume of darkness from Detroit to Venice? And, and also, of course, you know, is this an appropriate act to do? Um, is this something that can be done? And, and for something that relied so much on sort of being in a particular location and even being in a particular day or time or season, how would I then put it inside um, the Arsenale building at the Biennale that year? And it, it actually took me quite a long time and a lot of struggle to realize um, this project, which became called Unlit, but allowed me to literally revisit that same volume. And what I ended up doing was going back to that moment, um, this image I've already shown, where one of my first acts in the space was to try to capture the darkness fully. And I, I literally, when going into the garage, when doing the previous part, the weatherizing glass part, um, I spent a day trying to cover up every single light leak, trying to see if I could get absolute darkness, just in terms of a quest that I think we don't often get in our day-to-day -day spaces as much as we try. And so the interest with, with the Unlit project then became how can I actually, in essence, move the acts or move the volume of the space by moving um, this sort of cloaking of the space that I did by covering all the light leaks. So this project Unlit, it, it, in essence, same, same as what was happening with weatherizing, traces out some of the key important aspects of, of um, kind of realizing what that space is. So you, of course, see the peak you see the door swing um, and strong corners that are happening. And actually one thing that's entirely not there is that original window. Um, and this is actually made out of uh, wood. Uh, and that, that choice had to do of course with the fact that um, most commonly the boarded up, the material that's used to board up the windows or the doors is wood. And so I was interested in trying to see if I could take that same material and make it very, very delicate and, and allow that to be in essence, the trace that was brought to Venice. And one of the things that happened both by accident, but slowly kind of realizing its importance was, so the, the, the project is made, it's a, 
it was a basswood thinly, thinly cut, and on top of it was a wood veneer also thinly cut. And what was able to occur is that it was so thin. Um, and of course, if you can imagine, the humidity in Detroit is very different than the humidity in Venice. So the project actually sort of shriveled and curled the entire kind of biennale. So at the at the end of it, you know, it's it sort of had greater curls and and kind of wilted away, which I, I found to be actually very um, appropriate for this thought of this kind of darkness that's actually extremely fragile and and something that um, you know even with the the kind of uh, addition of any light source would 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 go away, like it's not actually something possible to see at the moment that light is added. Um, and this gives you a little bit more, this this image is used to maybe um, celebrate something that I take as one of the, I don't know, a, a kind of important success of the project in place. Um, some of these these uh, wooden members, this this was tracing out the door swing and, and the lines are, you know, we had the garage and behind this image is the rest of the house that others were working on. But you see the door swing and then what I was really interested in actually thinking about these being as in essence what covered up the light leaks was that I took the project and I really sort of um, pushed it to be not just the light that would have come under the door swing but to go towards this window that was in the Arsenale. And David Chipperfield was a curator of the of the Biennale that year and he had an insistence that the um, that he would be in control of all the light that was within the Arsenale and so all the windows were going to get boarded up. So I had a lovely meeting with him <laughs> where I explained the project and the interest of how this literally was talking about darkness and not and the sort of boarded up windows and that sort of thing. And he um, he agreed with me that the the light that was from Venice should be affecting this project. And so this remained to be the only window that was unboarded in the entire um, the entire arsenale that year. So I, I took it as kind of a, a strong sort of act of the ideas of this of this project. This shows you a couple more images and the details with the door swings. And, and actually, interestingly enough, um, just in terms, again, of kind of studying it through photograph and those optical effects, and, and maybe humorously with the project being called Unlit, it was, really, it was a really hard project to photograph. And this one's actually, of course, taken at night. And again, all the illumination is on its surroundings and not on the project at all. Because of course, it's not you know something that I dyed it a very, very dark black. Uh, of course, is not accepting its own light. So it, it kind of relies on the light of everywhere else to be able to actually see the project. And, and of course, that affected the name of it, Unlit, as well. And this gives you an image above. You're seeing, actually, this is the wind, This is the light in the background here coming in through that window. And so the, the kind of cast of that window now falling onto the project and, of course, giving you a, a very different view of the, this kind of silhouetting and patterning of the light leaks. And in between these two projects, so switching now to another project, this this one definitely relates in the way, and, and I mentioned that it's in between because I certainly think another way to present projects is to do it. If I did it in chronological order, you might start getting stories of how they start to feed one another, but I wanted to share this one as well because it has, it has a, in a way, some similar ethos. Um, the next project I wanted to share called Second Story it itself is also a cast of a project. In this case, it was, um, it is, because it still exists, it's the cast of a duplex funeral home or a duplex in Flint, Michigan, that was a funeral home um, that under the time that I was asked to do a project with it was under threat by the city to be demolished. And I was um, asked if there was anything I could do to help sort of draw attention to the work. And at first, well, I was, I was asked for two reasons. First, I was asked to come and just help them see how bad the water damage was in the building. And then I was also asked if there was something I could do that would give it good press so that it would delay delay its demolishing. So this, this project, Second Story, literally becomes that kind of casting as a way to sort of talk about what happens if we, if we lose those spaces. So here's, an, here's a simple Google um, street view image of that of that house and the project actually ends up being a cast of this space right up here. So part of the second story and part of the reason this is called second story. And so what I ended up doing was to literally, and this is using now acrylic rods. Um, I was interested in this case in terms of sort of tracing and skinning what was there. This use of acrylic rods was a way to be able to take the forms but not necessarily take the texture or the material, and instead to really kind of understand what that space is that's there. 
And so it was traced on the inside and the outside. So this gives you that interior view as well. And the interest was actually to think about what would actually happen if we lost this building? What it means, I think, particularly at a time when a lot of demolitions were happening, when we lose a sort of massing to our spaces and we basically there becomes there becomes a loss and there becomes sort of a, especially in kind of near field memory, there becomes a kind of a missing volume. And so these casts, which are both the inside and the outside, was displaced to a gallery. And the gallery had asked me at the same basically the same time I was kind of trying to help through this situation. Um, gallery in Chicago had asked me if I would um, present a work there and kind of not knowing, to be totally honest, what to do in a sort of perfectly clean gallery. Uh, it became really interesting for me to think through how can I, how can I maybe tell this story there? And so the, the, the interesting that happens is you can see if I'm casting the inside and the outside, one thing that we end up getting in this skin is, of course, the voids that would be things like the wall thickness. And so I purposely, in a way, kind of transferred the volumes, but I didn't do it in like a perfect, uh, you know, move this geometry exactly this way. I took the opportunity of switching it to, in essence, try to figure out if there were new volumes I could get by simply um, moving this sort of trace or ghost. And so you can see here, there's the difference in between. Let me show you a little bit more. I, I basically put them together at an angle. So I pulled them apart. So that wall thickness went from a thin area to a thick area to make this new inhabitable room here in the middle of the wall. The other new space, if I can go back and image here, was this would have been the windowsill. And in that kind of um, splaying out of the two walls, that stretched the windowsill. So I added more material there and, and kind of made this new space that we would jokingly call the sillway. It became sort of a hallway and the windowsill at the same time. And then the other sort of new space that would occur was just the ability now to have something that used to be the second story now down on the lower first story. And so you could walk around it, which of course is impossible if we think about the original house. And so interestingly enough, there's a couple of moments where the images, if you look at it, of course, you're seeing what might be the iconic form of the house. If you move around it in a couple of different angles, and this will become important to the next project I show as well, it starts to actually kind of um, become that much more ephemeral or in a way sort of dissolve and be get, get a little bit more ghostly or cloud-like. And that was a discovery that came just out of doing this project and stepping away from it and not really actually in the, in the meantime, realizing that I would start to get this kind of um, dissolving of the form of interest. And so the other thing I'll mention is that the project was suspended from the ceiling. So it didn't actually touch anything. The only thing that was able to touch uh, the ground was of course the shadows um, and anyone that um, was actually the occupant of the space or, um, you know, circumnavigating that, uh, that larger piece there. And this shows you a little bit of the detail. The geometries were based on the geometry of the roof line um, and just different ways, of course, structurally to hold the whole piece together. And then these pieces as well, if you think back now to some of the, the details that were happening in weatherizing, there was an interest for me to figure out how to actually imply the sort of larger space that would go missing with the demolition of this house. And so I bent and pulled these, I pulled them into thin little whiskers as a way to kind of capture maybe the atmosphere and, and to do something where I think a lot of my projects often throw into question, what is that sense of arrival? Like when have you arrived in the project or when are you in its space? Um, and, and when are you kind of um, part of that atmosphere or that condition? And so for me in this one, it became very direct to sort of thin that out in such a way that you couldn't maybe specifically say this was the boundary of this project or I'm in the wall or not in the wall. And this just goes back to the um, seeing those same kind of details now that we know what they are, it goes back to, to looking at those um, inside the house. And I'll just mention that the, sorry, I thought there was one more slide there. The, um, the, the house, uh, I, not, to, not to claim it with this project, but the claim it with the energy of those who are really trying to save it, it actually is still there. So it entirely exists and has been turned into other things as well. So I, I take that as a great, um, a great addition to this conversation about the kind of uh, what we lose if we actually literally lose the space and that you can't just simply, um, you can't just simply remove it without losing something else. And, and the, these things tie 
Some of these techniques, I'd say, more than these thinkings, tie into one more project that I think maybe specifically talks to the title Unphotographable uh, that you know, came from Carl earlier, but I want to share Overnight, which is an exhibition uh, that happened at the UMA Museum, the University of Michigan Museum of Art back in 2016. And Overnight was actually a combination, interestingly enough, of uh, installation and photographs. And for the first time in thinking through this project, I actually, I actually did my studying entirely through photography as a way to lead me into the project as opposed to the reverse where the project started to really lead me into different thoughts of the optical effects. So overnight, when I say overnight, it actually refers to both this installation, but also a series of photographs that were in this space, which are called nightly. And you've seen a few of them already in my intro slides, but I'll just share with you a little bit about them. I show this more backed up view because one thing that's impossible to share digitally um, and really hard to not to explain when you're not there is actually the images, they're printed in such a way that if you move around them, they, they gain and lose their saturation of color and they get a different kind of shininess to them. Um, and so it's actually, I'll be showing you the digital version of these, but unfortunately it's it's not necessarily easy to show. And there's some, maybe another, at another moment, there's some videos out there that start to show what the the activity is, but these, these to me, um, they cloaked the room, uh, but what they were actually, and, and I've shown a few, as I mentioned before in the introduction already, this is a, a series that I call Nightly. And I've done this series in many cities. I actually started it uh, with a deep investigation of, of darkness in, in Rome. Um, and actually even a project that Carl and I were working on a long time ago together uh, in Detroit called City Lights, uh, where we were thinking about darkness and light and spaces. I started to develop a way to photograph spaces that were um, that were in a lot of uh, kind of the deep of the night, or maybe even had a limited kind of um, situation or a limited kind of uh, uh, presence of artificial light. And the interest was actually, in this case, very specifically, at the time I was making this exhibition was the time in Detroit where there was still only about 40% of the streetlights left and the city was starting to use the public lighting authority to go ahead and replace all the lights. And they were shifting from the sodium vapor lamps, which were had a more orange um, warm glow to them to these really bright LED lights. And basically what I was doing was trying to run ahead of that project and capture this moment in Detroit that um, where there was a where there was a kind of a, a, a heavy, uh, there was just a lot of spaces that were very, very dark and unlit. Um, and in a way to kind of photograph them is something that uh, I, th I think I personally had a kind of mourning over losing some of this. Again, the kind of different things that we can get out of just the experience of what can be both the calm and of course, there's plenty of reasons to, to worry in other situations, you know, fears of the dark and things like that. But the interest was actually to capture things in an archive sort of way of that would, that of course, now you cannot take any of these photographs. These have been replaced with what I find to be sort of um, kind of, uh, super bright LED lights that I think are often something that can kind of mess with our common peace as well. Um, and so the work at the same time was interested in the fact I should mention that the, the street lights were also being transitioned from being wired underground in copper to being wired overhead in aluminum. And that was of course out of the effort to try to reduce the scrapping that was part of the reason that some of the the fixtures were slowly diminishing in number as well. And so I took the interest of that particular material of aluminum as the consideration to think through about the installation and, and the, the interest of that. So what I ended up doing was I ended up winding, winding aluminum into very, very tight strands um, as a way to basically make them even that much more. So alu aluminum is less conductive than copper, and but it still works, especially for LED lights. So I was trying to actually uh, increase their length even more to make them that less efficient uh, as sort of making a kind of a point of, you know, the kind of scarcity or what what is the different values and, and many different definitions of values for the two materials. And so, oh, there's a couple of images that slide in here that I mentioned, I brought them up to mention this kind of um, energy in some of the work that's always sort of just like drawing in the space. So these aluminum lines, and now you're seeing a, here's an image of the unlit, which we just saw as well. 
using these aluminum lines in this case to again kind of work through an architectural volume and literally draw in space. So these sort of these these were found very quickly and processed, and then in several of them actually uh, are wired all the way through to little tiny LEDs that were on the bottom. So they were the the project was very completely electrified, but you see the sort of like massing and cloud, and as you begin start to see um, the interest of actually tracing out some of these dark spaces and, and the question of sort of how much light do we need to see just enough to in the rest of the space or to give some of it illumination and then to also speculate on what might be deeper in the darkness as well. So there's actually a couple of the photographs back to the nightly that would be important for this. And in this case, the, the peak right here of the I think I could argue is enough for us to basically fill in the presence of the rest of this house. And so this is actually a, a key photograph in the series, as is this one, which which showed at the time the one, um, and this is a sodium vapor lamp, the one light that was left on this part of the road, and this is actually Oakland Avenue right here. I'm standing on um, the street just parallel to it. I'm standing in the alley um, behind uh, Melrose. And so this image also is a sort of hovering cloud and if you think through the stuff that i just spoke about with second story two also became a key image and i think it was the combination of those two that allowed me to really think through um what would be the installation in this space and here you can start to see more of the texture and the technique of having the aluminum and it also starts to fold and kind of turn corners to latch to one another so the the kind of um, connection through the street lights and then the other thing I'll mention, so this is actually the nighttime version. This is, there's a high graze lighting similar to the light that's affected in the, in the photographs. And by day, the interest was actually to figure out if there was something that I could make that was really hard to see by day. And so you walk into this space and you can see that the gallery is floor to ceiling windows on two corners, which is the corner, it's sorry, meaning two walls into a corner. And it's the corner that's opposite the entry of the space. So actually it was really, difficult to see the installation as you walked in, you were just seeing delicate, delicate lines in the space. And it took actually walking around to then have the photographs and the dark walls behind it to begin to see these two figures of um, of more cloud-like kind of architectural peaks that were hanging there. And it kind of relied instead. So by day you're getting the kind of the very light aluminum uh, in the foreground of a very um, kind of slate gray, paint and then at night you're getting all of the um the high grazing from the light to really kind of see these as floating ghosts and again if you move a little bit off to the side of those you start to have this um this sort of uh more cloud-like and uh less defined image of that of that space that's there and that actually brings me you know, these visual aspects, I want to now shift a little bit to some of the material research that I've been doing. Um, I want to quickly show a project called Eclipse, because as I mentioned, I think some of the work that Alibi Studio is doing now is trying to actually push it deeper into um, spaces that may in a way be, uh, have a different definition of delicacy or permanence and, and may start to push towards how can we actually allow ourselves over longer durations to kind of live with some of these aspects of the, the kind of optical changes or the relationship to dark and night. Eclipse folds out of um, really carefully looking at optical effects that are happening in uh, in glass. And I have, I have several projects I've done in the past, a lot of them along with one of my friends and colleagues, Wes McGee, in terms of just like looking at different ways uh, to form glass, um, both into kind of a consideration of what its shaping might be, but also particularly the way that I start to spin off of it uh, as well has to do with some of the light effects that occur either through the reflection or the refraction actually on those pieces. And so here's just a couple of details of images of some of the things we've done in terms of just thinking through space making, which led to some optical considerations with reflection. So most recently that allowed for the opportunity to work with a specific uh, set of flat pieces of glass. And this is a hard image without me describing it more to understand what's going on here. But what it is, is these, um, these columns are showing the same uh, piece of glass, like stack of glasses, but seen at slightly different angles. And because the glass is either a little bit colorized or there's a few um, coatings involved, 
This is the same bundle of glass, but it gives you very different colors based on the angle that you are in. And so a project developed out of this, which actually ended up being a rather, uh, it was a rather long investigation that ended up into being something that's super simple that then behaves in a way that uh, optically is, is a bit complex. And I wish that we were all standing in a gallery and we could see this together, but um, the work is called Eclipse and I'll describe a few details and then show a quick video that helps us kind of see the relationship to the glass. But what's happening here is that the what you're seeing this is a triangle shape on the floor um, and so what happens is you actually go from a thick area to a thin area and that gives you some changes in the color you also go from seeing straight through some of the glass to seeing it at an angle so the greens that you're seeing here is based on my height with the camera and my, as i get slightly just off angle you start to see the yellows. And then of course, if you start to move around, you also start to begin to like realize a different relationship to the thickness of the glass. So I'll show a little bit of a video, um, which, will, which would show you the experience of what you would see from, from my height, knowing that you know if Carl, for example, was standing next to this, his greens would be much taller and he'd have much more gold on the bottom. But let me, um, let me switch to a video quickly. Um, if I just share screen to this, back it up here. So this now, this is a walk around of that. So you're seeing, um, and it'll start in a second. We're standing at the point here and I'm trying to hold very still to kind of move around. And at the moment you go from seeing, oh, it's a bit slow, sorry about that. Hopefully it'll just take a second. You go from seeing now through some thickness to now seeing through some thinness and you see that the color changes for you. And now by the time you get to the side, all that dark that's coming has a lot to do with how it's actually working with uh, the glass composition and how you can't now see the whole way through. And then you get back around and you start again to see colors, this time of course too with a light behind you as opposed to the light being what you see through. This will, this will then move into the kind of details that are happening there. And I show you this because we're actually trying to work on thinking through like what this could mean to become, um, you know, to deploy this more in like a larger wall system or a different way of stacking through a space. And so now, oops, sorry, it's gotten a little slow again on my side. Um, maybe this is a good pause moment. You can see the thinness here with these colors and then you actually end up getting very different colors as you get again back to um, that sort of longer, longer piece there, this moment here, it's relying in totally on reflection instead of see-through and popping up again. And now you can start to see what's beyond in the, in the sort of window. And so that actually has recently been one of our, um, I don't know, maybe the kind of trying to think through and, and even understand a little bit more of what's happening. I'm just gonna switch back to some stills now. Um, there we go. Can you see the stills again? Okay. So this, of course, also has a strong relationship with a difference between night and day. This this naturally is a shot now from outside of the exhibition space at nighttime where it's artificially lit and having very different, um, you kind of lose some of the extremes of the coloration at night. So it becomes a different object where actually the things that you're seeing only in reflection stand out more than the, than the seeing the transparencies. And there's just a current kind of study. This is our, this is an edge detail. And then these, of course, interestingly enough, get to be some of the colors at some of the thinner moments, which is surprising that in other moments that it's actually the green or the gold that overwhelm what the eye sees. And so we've been working with that and trying to develop that a little bit, um, a little bit further into um, bigger ideas. So even bigger, I'm gonna move to another project here. Sorry, I'm just gonna check on on time, it looks like it's looking good. Um, a project that was finished uh, just a little bit over a year ago, but took me maybe three years in the making um, is a project I'd like to share now that's called Secret Sky. And interestingly enough, I think it's fair to say that this was Alibi Studios first, um, first real permanent work where I think the things that we would talk about that could be seen as more ephemeral or delicate consideration remained to be about its sort of optical or presence to day and night, um, but really actually was looking at what it can do at the scale of the building. And so I was asked, there's a group who is slowly building up a set of barns in um, around the Port Austin area of Michigan. Uh, it's 
kind of loosely called the 10 Artists, 10 Barns Project. Uh, actually, Steve Coy is, did the first barn, Steve and Gerota Coy. So you guys may know some of this work already. Um, but uh, so I was asked to look at a barn and to see what could be done with it. And I think I kind of uh, <laughs> took the scale of the interest of maybe doing something simple to really take the chance to think through, like, what could I do at a building scale where the kind of reformation of the barn um, became the, the kind of important aspect where it wasn't just sort of tracing it or making it delicate or reworking the materials, but it was literally working with the size of that building. And so the barn itself is on this uh, property. Here's a little barn. It was, it's a setback. It kind of stands alone beautifully. It's a little bit kind of solitary of a barn and it's running along the road where there's a bunch of trees and you, you enter the driveway. And that's sort of your glimpse to this barn. And what I was really interested in in this area actually was of course, um, just the, the sky being so big and open. I think that's what really struck me as I was looking at these barns. And interestingly enough, it has this very strange uh, relationship to scale where the barn feels like a very large object, but then you're in the sky and all of a sudden that makes it very small or the distance between two barns or across several farms uh, kind of changes your relationship to thinking how big this might be. So this is these are just a couple of early images where I was interested in the kind of um, the barn setup. And this also is an image taken very early in the project from inside. And, you know, the kind of cracks of light coming through are, are not something foreign to what my interest might be. And so I did have early moments where I thought maybe I should just invite people to come and sit inside this barn. It's so beautiful. But this interior aspect I'll show you in a moment really related to some of the things I wanted to do on the exterior. Excuse me. And so this, this, I think, may have been one of the formative photographs in the study, but this is a moment where a hole that was already in one side of the barn uh, aligned with another one and then aligned as well with the light coming through. And I think at that moment, I realized uh, a growing interest that I had, which was to figure out how to keep the iconic form of the barn, but to allow it to open up to the sky so that the sky really was what the delicate active change was and the barn was becoming a new space to uh, to inhabit that. And so I mentioned that this took two or three years in the making and a lot of it actually, and this is, this is not something indifferent to a lot of some of my other work, but a lot of the projects I do have a lot of effort into tending to the spaces that they're in. So in a way kind of caretaking or, or caring for those spaces. So a lot of the early effort had to do with um, stabilizing the barn, fixing moments of the foundation, replacing, some things that were rotted and, and in essence getting to know the barn um, as a structure. And so that took time. And then now this zooms up very fast. This this then leaps about a year and a half in time. But the other thing that was worked up to was figuring out how to in essence kind of restructure the barn to allow for a bigger maneuver. Maybe I need to jump to the maneuver so it becomes clear. Well, let me just say this is some of the structural work that was done on the inside because I was interested in trying to figure out how to slice through the light here. And so let me go to an image that tells you a little bit more. Here we go. This helps. This helps a little bit more than I'll back out. So the work actually ended up trying to figure out how to take a slice out of the barn that allowed it to open to the sky, but in also kind of reworked it volumetrically. And so it's important to note that while maybe a, a, a kind of more widely shared image of the barn is this one, where it looks like what could probably be a simple slice. If you really unpack that and think that through, there's a lot of restructuring that happens to pull that off. And the important thing is that it wasn't also something that was remained either flat. I had a big interest in actually making that a space. So now you can see here uh, in terms of one of my, um, one of my helpers, Residing this barn, the space inside was actually in a way kind of pulling the, the siding on through and making this space that literally cut from the front to the side and allowed us to inhabit that. So you see a cut from uh, the side here. Sorry, let me just, I have to move all of you guys so I can move my pointer here. Um, this is the front of the barn. And I kept the one moment where some of the structure on the front in the gambrels remain stable and then there's a cut that continues back through the roof and that's what actually allows that effect to happen and the inside becomes a residing of those two pieces so in a way you actually move through the barn and you stay outside you don't actually get into the original barn 
but you are in fact kind of swallowed or within that original barn at the same time. And so maybe this image perhaps gives a good um, view of the space that's created where this slice, this becomes the new wall to the main barn and this part, which is in essence severed from the original barn acts as a, a, a very delicate thin um, fin to that space. And you're able to walk through this and experience it that way. And so of course it, um, as you can imagine, as I mentioned before, with some of the interest, it very much so depends on what time of day you're there, what season it is, where the light happens to be that day and that sort of quality to really get the different kind of experiences that this barn and its textures allow for. And, just the kind of um, different vantage points of looking up, and some of the details that I think we really sort of obsessed over in terms of just how to make that final cut. And the I should mention, interestingly, that the siding, of course, is way more siding, you know, in terms of adding two facades. It's actually siding from, the, from a barn that was about a mile north of this one that blew down during this project. And that, that barn was slated to be one of the next art barns and so in a way, we, we kind of saved this barn and also saved um, saved that barn as well by literally taking that barn um, and that barn wood that was generously donated to make this, uh, to make that interior space. So it's, it's two barns in that location. And then this gives you some of the other details that we really worked through in terms of understanding and the sidings coming through and how to interact with this would have been where a big barn door was you can see the the kind of ghosting of the the where this would have held sure uh, for the barn door to slide over but to still continue to have that understanding of that through and the, the sort of patternings that would have been um, expected out of the barn so this gives you the side view and maybe helps to also understand a little bit more about about that slice that's happening there and then you see great different point. You get to actually see this space as its own, um, in essence, standalone little little building that's happening uh, on that case. And then, naturally, of course, it is, uh, as I mentioned before, it really has to do when you're there. What what crops are in the field at the time? The sky is at that moment. This you can see. This image was taken just after a little bit of a rainstorm. Um, and really kind of working through that, but as a way to to understand this again as a space that you can walk through. Oops, that went a little bit too fast. Um, and so this this image I think is one that also kind of tells the story quite well in terms of getting that, that sliver of the sky uh, in the condition. And of course, um, I had already shown you the sneak peek of what was happening on the inside. It takes quite a structural maneuver to pull this off, although it looks quite, um, quite simple from the from the outside. And again, similar to maybe some of the conversations that came up in weatherizing, I was very interested in the um, how this would actually also uh, act at nighttime. And so trying to figure out how to fold that in. And so you can see, of course, there's magical things that happen based on the sunsets, but also the space, if it's illuminated from the inside, this relates to that original um, image that I showed you of, of what it was on the inside, in this case, trying to get it reversed on the outside with an interest to allow light, um, which we are still working on setting up with a solar panel, but to allow the illumination of the interior of these two volumes to then trace out the lines on the landscape. And actually, I, I love looking at the barn this way as sort of a lantern out. It does stand alone by itself, but this is an image um, that's taken actually looking the other way and you see these lines going up and then going up those trees that I mentioned before. And it really kind of interestingly splays out the barn all the way um, across the ground here and then up those trees, which I, I, I find to be for me the biggest treasure of that, that kind of nighttime effect. And then other things occur. This is um, this happens to be the moon aligning with it. I think a lot of people often ask if I aligned it perfectly with some sort of equinox or something like that, and I didn't. It's it's more so left to the chance of when you're there, um, and that that kind of relationship. But of course, it works out well in terms of um, how it how it runs uh, the long sides run east to west, uh, and that just kind of gives you a sense of those. So that's the that's all I have for the barn. I had one more project, Carl. Do I have time? Should I share the hideout a little bit, or should we stop here? Please share it. <laughs> okay. Um, so simultaneously uh, working on the barn, I'd say the, the barn, the barn being pushed forward, 
uh, a bit faster. So maybe we'll say overlapping. I've been working on a project in Detroit called The Hideout, and that, that pairs with us being called Alibi Studio. Uh, the Hideout seemed appropriate for our studio space. And what it is, and this is on Mount Elliott, it's right across from the Mount Elliott Cemetery. Um, it was the sawdust building for a lumber yard that would have been back over this way, maybe a half a block more. Um, and so the building is where the scraps from the lumber yard were sent to become either kindling or sawdust. Kindling, of course, for, for fire and sawdust to be used on the, um, on the roads before we are putting salt down for ice. So sawdust for, for tending to the roads. And this building now is about 103 years old. And one of the magical things about it um, is that it not only does it have all these trees that have kind of been left unattended growing around it, but it also um, kind of secretly hides. So again, I mentioned this is Mount Elliot. This is Kershaw. This is the Mount Elliot Cemetery and the Elmwood Cemetery is over this way, but you can't actually see it because of this canopy of trees over here. And it's strangely a little bit sat back from the, set back from the road. So it's, um, I'm sort of trying to just like kind of treasure it for its, uh, its sort of hiding and hideout experience. But um, I'm trying to hurry through to get to an image that shows, well, this shows it, if, it, if it's not clear yet, or I haven't said it yet, the building has no roof. And so what it is, is I didn't really buy a building. I just bought walls. And so this was, this was right about the time that I got it. Um, beautifully overgrown on the inside as well from years of um, not having a roof and leaves building up and lots of soils and things growing. And this was actually a two-story sort of... Um, equipment loft in a way um, that was wood. It was it was taken down, but I would say this kind of image gave me insight into where it's heading now and, and heading kind of um, in, a, in a manner where one can realize that it's it has this funny trace of scale and I'll share that with some other images right now, but if this is a two-story space, it gives you a sense of that kind of scale and then also just the sort of vegetation within. And so, sorry, my slides are going a little slow right now. There we go. So after it was cleared out, and it was cleared out, of course, because there was a bunch of debris um, and, and just as a way to begin to work out of it, this gives you a sense of that, um, in a way, sort of hidden courtyard space that's here in the city. Um, this is this over here, this way would be the cemetery. You can uh, anchor yourself a little bit with the old chimney that's in place. But this is an image showing the walls. And so our first acts were to uh, stabilize the walls. As you can imagine, with there not being a roof anymore, and this is about 80 feet by 30 feet, it doesn't have the lateral support for the walls. And so we had to make some cut into the walls to give them uh, side walls that would in essence act sort of like buttresses and it would shorten the distance that a wall was spanning before it had some lateral support. And so very, um, very carefully, these walls were cut and turned in and we did it in very particular moments. So this one is around a big tree that was starting to grow into the, to grow into the, um, to the walls a little bit, but also with an interest to make sure that the tree survived more than the building. And so this cut was taken in this location and then there's a couple other cuts. So now you're seeing it here. Um, other walls were added where it, this one was one of the windows. So just like this one cut down to be a door and then turned in. So this kind of acts as the, um, the catch for the door swing coming in that way. We used, um, we tried to reuse as much as we could of the blocks. You can see here, we ran out a little bit. So this would be um, the hint of a, of a kind of new wall, but all of these either came from the adjustment of this, or it had a little kind of step up here um, that was falling apart in such a way. So that became our salvage pieces to make and stabilize the roof. And then the last thing we did was put a structural ring around here, which I think is a bit hard to see in this image, but maybe a little bit more clear here, but there's a structural ring that solidifies and holds that in place. And then the, these, I should also mention, were, um, were filled with concrete. So the walls are not going anywhere. And the hope then is within this space to build a small little studio. And the interest is to actually make something that's probably more of like a glass box so that really the kind of light of looking up and the, the trees. So like something rather simple that's then surrounded by a bunch of vegetation. And this, as you can imagine, was somewhat brought to a, a halt, but also a benefit with COVID. Um, when the virus started, this literally was maybe like week two of allowed to be out 
plants kind of in a way, or basically when gardening was open back up. Um, I knew that I wanted to regrow in the space, like I wanted green into the space. And so uh, leaning on some work that some of my other friends actually up in the barns had done, which were just simply growing hops, um, I decided to put some lines through the space. So there's some wires that go through and just do a pattern of line work that would allow for um, hops to grow up through them. And, and interestingly enough, I think what this did, and, and maybe, I would I share this because I think this is something that as we try to feel out how we actually do bigger work is important. And I've mentioned that the projects are kind of for me a, I feel like I'm drawing in space or like using delicate lines to figure out volumes. Um, I'm actually really grateful that COVID kind of stopped uh, what may have been a more hurried schedule for this project because I was using the line work of the plants to draw into the space and to really start to see. Um, I think it's better in this image, just even where the light it falls during the day and like where it gets caught. And to understand also the feeling of what's it like something interior again to say, for instance, be the same height as the wall or to be at a certain location. And so I don't show the hop so much as a great feat, but I show them now as kind of a, a, an interesting method of us continuing to draw into space to understand that sort of um, that sort of massing and, and to literally maybe go from something that being used to actually applying it again. So you can see hints in the background here, just fire pits, maybe the most simple kind of way of saying like, let me just hang out in here all day long to just understand what that space is. But now I'll mention that we actually have, we have it, it's on the books now. We're drawing through the details of getting that so that hopefully um, all going well, of course, as we get through a winter and then back to a build season that there's a, we start to actually get the, the studio and the space and then to fill it up with as much as much vegetation as possible. And so I'll just leave it there. This, uh, we have the evocative image of things to come, um, but I think that gives a good sweep of maybe some of our our interest in ways of working and and hopefully a hint of maybe what you'd see from us in a year or two, I would say. So that's all I have. Thank you. And I'm, I know you're willing to answer some questions too, and maybe as people think about those things, maybe I'll kick it off because you said something just at the at the very end about like drawing in the space. And I was thinking a lot about representation and you didn't, I don't think you showed a single drawing, but you did show some photographs. And I, I was really taken with the, I don't know, I, I was thinking about like a kind of mark making with a kind of excessive labor of that kind of mark making as you try and define a volume or define a space or define an experience around those things. And, and maybe, I don't know if you could just talk about that a little bit because and I think you were you were um, explicit in your thinking I'm sure about not including any drawings do you draw as it relates as a way to think about these things or are you only working in material but it does there is a strange inversion right that the many of the projects feel like a like a representation of something or a kind of capturing of something but in space in material and so yeah. that the, maybe the resonance between how we typically think about representation versus the way that your work is almost a kind of physical manifestation of a representation simultaneously. Yeah. If that's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's a fair, I think that is a fair read. I mean, I don't often show drawings because I don't do a lot of drawings to answer that part of the question. I think a lot of times my drawings, um, are made either only as a manner to talk to machines or engineers involved, or um, or if somebody invites me to do a drawing for a book or something like that. I mean, it's not totally fair to say I do do drawings to help me to help me think through things like pattern and densities and volumes. But I I do actually very much so believe in a lot of the work that the drawing in space also comes as a decision making factor. So. For all my projects, I usually ghost things out with strings. And I, I, I do find that both that and the photograph conversation has a lot to do with knowing that I think some of the things that I'm interested in or drawn to or envision are not easy to draw at all. 
and that I also in a digital world can't relate to them in such a way. So I, I do draw, you know, the, the hideout, for instance, especially because we're working, you know, we had to get permits and run it by a structural engineer, totally exists in drawing, has a drawing set. Um, but strangely, just even looking at that set, I can never spatially relate to the relate, like the walls are 14 feet tall, but other things happen because of the size of the windows and where they actually hit me here as opposed to here. And so I find that I have to draw into space to feel confident about my decisions or to feel confident might seem like I'm not confident otherwise, but to feel that I actually resonate with the space. And I do like the idea of the mark making that you're talking about, because I, I agree that the, especially the earlier work is much more of like capturing something that's there and it's going to get whisked away. Um, maybe that's why I also use terms like ghosting and things that, you know, are delicate and ephemeral or, or in a way kind of are gone. And that is a way to kind of mark that particular moment in time. But I think you're also right. There is sort of a lot of labor and that labor I do think going back to the drawing part of it, I don't draw out every part as particularly those more um, kind of aggregations in the earlier works. They're never totally drawn out. There's never um, kind of construction documents. And instead it actually takes the making to get to a point where it feels like, okay, this is the right quantity or I've gotten the essence of this space now, um, which I think if I were to follow a drawing, I would, uh, I would find it falling short or not quite right. <laughs> I don't know if ever if any of the, the ones always feel totally right, but I think that um, for me, the drawing doesn't allow, drawing as we conventionally think of it, doesn't allow me to make the decisions that I think are getting across the effects that I'm after. Could there then be a flip side to that, that, the, that they're unphotographable because they're also undrawable? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a great question. You know, I started to do some video as well. And that's becoming extremely frustrating. Um, yeah, I think I feel like maybe the unphotographable aspect has a little bit more to do with um, that, I think, loses some of the sense of space or gives you only one angle or one time of day. And so, yeah, I love the difficulty in photographing some of them but I find that the, photo, the unphotographable feels like a falling short because you can't get all of it. And it, I guess it goes back to saying what you, you know, what I'm happy that you have seen as well is that I think a lot of times the projects are actually just meant to be seen in person and they're meant to be, they're in a way meant to be very solitary experiences. And I really do feel that um, like no one without seeing, you know, it's an unfortunate thing that they kind of require somebody to see them in person, but it, it is also a gift to those who who happened to be in that space at that time. So why don't, we can open it up to questions. I'm not, there's no questions on YouTube yet, but I'm sure there's some questions here. I'm sure Emily has a question. She, she said she was going to call on me last week, but maybe I'll call on her now. <laughs> um, okay, I'll ask my question. Um, well, so first, first, Katie, thanks so much for your talk. And I think it was, um, it was really exciting, you know, having known you now for a, a long time also um, as, a, as a student, as an MR student. Um, I, I, it's it's been you know some of the work I think I've I've seen a, a couple of times or I've I've even tried to make drawings of, um, <laughs> and you know successfully or unsuccessfully, um, and I think that uh, I, I was it was really exciting to see the some of the later projects that I haven't heard you talk about yet, um, and and to sort of witness you as you're jumping and scale from these really kind of intimate. Um, very kind of finely grained installation projects to now a kind of um, larger scale way of working in space. Um, and, and so I was, I was thinking a lot about site um, as, you were, as you were talking. And I, I think the reason I wanna ask you about site is, is also because when I was a student, uh, when you were my professor, you really, I think 
put a lot of pressure on the way that I understand sight or, or relate to sight or even feel kind of responsible to sight. Um, and, and so I was, was wondering maybe two things. If you could talk a little bit more about how you how you read sites, um, even before you do any work there, you do any making, um, how you how you're able to um, to get, perceive some of the very delicate nuances that I think your work kind of brings to brings to light and helps helps others to to perceive. Um, so, so that is a question. Sort of what how do you approach site? Um, and then tied to that also, as you scale up, as you work in larger scale spaces, um, ha has that changed for you at all? Um, ha has your understanding of site or your approach to site altered in any way, moving from kind of installation to larger scale work? Yeah, these are fantastic questions. And, and I do actually, Going off of Carl's question really quick as a side note, want to point out that Emily has drawn my work before very beautifully. And I think I had her do it because I couldn't do it <laughs> um, as a side note. So maybe as a public gratitude to you, Emily, thanks for ever doing that in the first place. Um, I love these questions about sight because you're totally right. It's it's really important to me and the, the process of being there. I actually, maybe also as a side note to it, I find it very hard to design at a distance from a site. Maybe that's the strangeness of this time right now, or um, maybe even a reason that I often feel like I struggle with competitions or something like that because I can't be spatially there. And so I think my approach to a site is something that happens. It does happen very physically, but I often think that the observation also has a lot to do with what materials are actually there. Um, and I think it goes hand in hand with reading the site and reading what the process of the materials have already gone through or the story that they're going through. So if I can speak to, you know, I brought up aluminum in the overnight, you know, the choice of that aluminum had so much to do with the fact that aluminum was what was happening to the streetlights and how that would, and I wanted it, I want those choices to serve as a little bit of a like commentary or a revealing of what's happening at the site at that time. So I think, so site for me, is physical and does everything between like views and light and that kind of thing. But it also has to do with like picking up on the thread of that moment in time and understanding that whatever I do at that particular moment is going to carry on. We're going to get whisked away or there will be more stories that come in the, that kind of come in the future. And I, I like to allow sites to kind of leave me with those decisions. Cause I, I think that I always feel that a project is not done until it feels like it resonates with that site. And so I think one thing that I like to think through is that I often feel like the way, the, the interest that I have about a site becomes a sort of description of that site. And a project is successful if I describe the project and it also sounds the way, the same way as the description of that site. I think for me, that's a, that becomes a sort of successful feeling like it resonates with that. And, and maybe that picks up a little bit now on your insights about scaling up. Um, I think it's been happening in a very slow motion because I've always kind of myself wondered what's a way to transition this work to end up um, really learning from the stuff I've done before or to not simply fall back on, on things that I think could be very, um, you know, sort of, sort of knowns uh, in terms of ways of making or ways of construction, but to, and I, I'm, I'm personally, I've been really struggling with some of the textures that I'm trying to put into this last hideout project I was talking about, because I, I struggle with the transition of inside to outside, but how to still make it weatherproof and still have it feel like it's a full thickness and not just component parts. Um, and so I think, you know, that kind of relationship to site that's more of a relationship to the materials with the site, but the relationship to the site now with kind of um, building up has a lot to do with understanding what gets to be permanent. Like I, I almost think in a way all the earlier work knew that it was going to go away. And now that it's permanent, I've, I am finding myself putting much more weight on the decisions um, and realizing that the impermanence that I think is so important to the ephemeral aspects has to come from things like the light effects or how something, um, I mean, I guess maybe delicacy in my work or many aggregations always has to do with a little bit of making things fuzzy, uh, you know, or like hard to perceive, like I said before, where something begins and ends. And, and I think now 
I'm relying on sight to bring the effects uh, and to be what transitions if the work is what's permanent, as opposed to it used to being that the work was very temporary and the story of the site is what was permanent. Thank you. Sure thing. Thanks for asking that question. Thanks for reminding me how to describe sites to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think there is something really beautiful about the way that you just talked about that, that the, that, and I think you and I have talked about it, it related to other work in the past that architects often, well, we have an ongoing debate that architects don't make things, right? Architects design things and you disagree with that clearly with your work, but I think that Thanks. I would, <laughs> <laughs> but I would also say that I, th I think a lot of what architects do, like if we think about an architect in a very traditional sense, is like defining interior and exterior. And that's often a very explicit boundary condition. And most of your work really just looks to try and erode that or make that incredibly ephemeral. So, you know, I was going to jokingly say it's like, it's not easy being Katie because, <laughs> you know, that's a very, you're, you're, constantly grappling with that really difficult position. And now when you have to actually put, define something in space that is gonna do that, you're, you've, you spend a long time doing that and thinking about that and reconsidering it and re-reconsidering it and then constantly working through that and questioning it. And so it's, it's in that interrogation that I think is something that's really beautiful. And so like seeing the work as that kind of deep investigation of those types of efforts that are almost impossible efforts as well. Yeah. Katie, Even, do you also, sorry, go on. No, I was Please. just going to say that Carl totally just nailed one of my current current conversations in my head. Sorry, Philip. <laughs> no, it's all right. I was, I was thinking about this all the time you were presenting and exactly what Carl just brought up is this relationship, you know, between, between the drawing as an analog for the outcome where architect, for architects. So in a lot of what I, a lot of the work that I see you do disciplinarily is an architecture. It's, formally as an outcome, it becomes at the scale of architecture, but your processes are not um, traditionally architectural because of your relationship, I think, between the apparatus that you're using, the, you're not using drawing, you're actually using the, the moves and the marks within space in real time and in real scale. Mm -hmm. And that's a really unusual situation. And, and so I'm, I'm really curious now as you scale up, what mechanisms, you're gonna have to translate that somehow because the mechanisms aren't gonna work anymore because of the, sh the shift in scale and your capacity to actually run the investigation the way traditionally. And so I wonder what, what you might actually do or how are you going to translate that as you start changing in scales? Yeah, it's a, it's a major question. And I, I find instinctively, uh, I feel like I resonate with very, very, like not tiny homes, but small buildings, for example, you know, that I, I find that the, the kind of, transition can only happen sort of slowly because I'm trying to figure this out as I go. And it, the barn taught me, it made me start to think of something as that size as being just an object, which is a strange thing to say. But I had a moment when I was working on the barn that all of a sudden I was back in the town that was near to. And I realized that all the houses were smaller than the barn. And I was like, no problem, no problem. I can make this object. <laughs> this is, you know, and you're absolutely right though, in terms of I've, I've reached a point now and, and I, I should mention, of course, I have amazing, wonderful people working with me to help me do some of the extremely large maneuvers, but I've reached the point now where I can't just like move this, you know, piece of steel by myself to say like, right here, right here, right here, that kind of thing. And you've, you've kind of nailed one of the big questions that I'm asking myself as I, as I scale up. And I think, you know, to some extent I can continue to, to kind of volumetrically draw in space and hunt these certain effects, but I now have to lean on larger production systems if it scales up in that way. And I don't know yet what they are. I hope to report back soon. Uh, you should come in. We'll play with you. We'll get some of the VR stuff running. Yeah, uh, you know. <laughs> come hang out with us for a couple of days. It sounds perfect. I have, I have um, particularly for this hideout project, I've, I've now seen the volume and the spacing in VR, and, and I greatly appreciate that as a kind of um, a mechanism to really feel out of space. 
you know, in terms of making design decisions, it's absolutely, it was something that I didn't actually think would be in my kind of tool set. But now that I've done it for a piece of work where I'm trying to decide sort of, you know, too big, too small, just right. Um, I was shocked to figure out that that is something. So I'll, I'll certainly come, definitely. I'm gonna take it as clues that people unmuted their video. And so I see Lillian live now. Do you have a question, Lillian? Um, I missed a portion of the question period, but I'm curious about the, so if, if this has been addressed, forgive me, but I'm curious about kind of the, like the teamwork that you put together to realize these things. So in a few of your, photographs we saw you know some evidence of other people in the spaces and and you know clearly like you know the question about scale um, speaks so much to to gathering the right type of people around making this happen so I'm curious yeah. about that a little bit absolutely yeah I know the teamwork is certainly there and I, I hope that all of those slides came up for long enough to give all the due credit for everyone that has helped me tremendously. And as I scale up, of course, I'm leaning on, on those who know how to make it bigger scales with bigger materials. And, and I think, um, you know, I realize even the earlier work, none of it I could do by myself. So there, there's a lineage of doing some of the earlier installations with my dad, if I can give a shout out to him. And then oftentimes I think as well, that the material research has to happen for a long time for me to fit a kind of aha moment of what that is. And then once it's there, I, I take great joy and even need to bring in other people to help me make the sort of like many, many parts. And I think now as I scale up even more, I have to shout out to like, et cetera, construction and shepherd engineering for like being the kind of um, support team that believes in the strange stuff and the willingness to help pull it off both in like reality and construction. And so I find the team, you know, I, the collaborations I think are amazing too, just in terms of the, the things that, you know, help to fit in the questions you can't do on your own, but then also fit in these magical moments of something that totally resonates that one would never think of by themselves. And so, yeah, it's a completely, I wish I could just keep showing those slides over and over again to give gratitude for everyone who's helped me so many times, but it's it's very clear and very necessary. Luke, do I take your live video as a, as an opportunity to ask a question, then I see Libby was just coming too. Oh uh, yeah, I actually do have a question. Um, I was uh, surprised at how perfect the barn looked in its photographs. It sort of looked like one day you could just snap and there was a Boolean difference and all of a sudden this barn changed. And I guess that what I mean by that is that I was surprised how little of the site was impacted by the um, construction of what happened. You'd mentioned, you know, how long it took and how um, maybe complicated the structure needed to be to achieve that. And so I guess I'm just curious how you are able to um, maybe get to that aha moment you were describing over a period of time without maybe um, destroying something that was required to achieve that aha moment or um, maybe how you're able to leave such a small footprint on the site and be very intentional with, what, with what's left behind. Yeah, that's a super insightful question with the barn. Um, the aha moment with that one came, as you mentioned, I think actually because the material is so big, like the size of the wood, the size of the barn, I, it did force a way of thinking that required me not to so much aggressively act on the barn at first, but to really kind of study what was happening there with the approach, with the light, with the shaping of it. But the interesting thing with the barn so much of the work was interior for so long, kind of tending to it, um, fixing the foundations, fixing the beams, and then literally actually making the structure. And, and I realize now I'm, maybe I showed some of the slides out of order for its kind of clarity. But uh, 
I would say, you know, for like a year and a half, everything we did was quietly inside the barn. And so even like passerbys or anyone who came to visit, it looked like we weren't doing anything or, you know, maybe it was questionable, like, why are there cars there or something like that? And so the work, the work was so internal for so long that the moment we started to go to the outside, we were actually ready to make the cut. And so strangely enough, it did sort of happen that fast because I think some of the people that originally went by thought, oh, you're, you're just saving, you know, you're just kind of renovating it or save, maybe um, restoring it. And people would stop by and ask, like, can you work on my farm too? Um, but there was this clear moment when the scaffolding went up on the outside and we started to work up high and literally just like opened this thing up that it actually did go quite quickly, even though there had been years of work already to make that possible. And so I think that that might be, it's an interesting read you have of it kind of being a delicate touch on the site um, because it was so, it was hidden for so long. And I, I do think it was sort of a wonderful moment to crack it open and then to watch cars like start to slow down. <laughs> I mean, like the double take or the people started to pull in once we really kind of cracked it open. Hi, Libby, Libby. Jump in. Hi. Hi, Katie. Hi. How you doing? Good so, I just, so first, I just wanted to say hi. Katie has been um, so she was a, a mentor at our um, our science fair. She came and she yeah. was there with our middle schoolers and actually our elementary and middle schoolers um, from our school district and uh, to take photos, especially. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. So that was really awesome. Um, and so hi, it's nice to see you again. Likewise. And I was thinking about when you were showing the, especially the the property, the the hideaway, and the inside where the the overgrowth it was so tall and it reminded me of some sites that I've been to I don't remember which countries specifically I think it might have been in Mexico I think it might have been in a few other places where um, the sites have been basically reclaimed by nature that have been like that were not even necessarily ancient but had been there a long time and then were left were abandoned and have now are these mounds and they're so complete with earth that you wouldn't even necessarily know there were human made uh, structures underneath those and right. it's fascinating and i was wondering you know that's not the focus of your work or your talk but i was wondering if that comes into it at all this idea of sort of nature coming back and reclaiming its own space that either we have destroyed or left or you know something something along those lines so I didn't know if if you're thinking about that for your future work or if that's yeah all. there's some interesting spin-offs with that I mean the vines of the barn for example are already growing back and there was a heartbreaking moment to have to tear some of them down mm -hmm. uh, especially because the owner of the barn also found them to be really precious um and maybe that cues in at a sort of same time of starting to try to think through, like, I personally am very much so an outdoors person, if that's not clear with some of the work as well. And <laughs> having a sort of, um, as, as, as many are, and maybe we all should be having much more of an environmental um, kind of focus or ambition for some of the work too, I think that may come as well, like an underlying kind of... Um, well, it, it underlines in the sense of wanting to be in more of those spaces, of course, and wanting to be just kind of deeper in the woods. It also sort of underlines maybe a little bit back to Philip's question. I think part of an interest of even making very small spaces has to do with the idea that if we just make less and make smaller, there's already less energy and less damage and things like that. And maybe the last, the, another twist off that your question made me think of as well, it's like come to realize inside the hideout with what you're saying about the kind of mound of earth and all the tree leaves like it of course gets a dumping of leaves all the time and and sort of preciously gets um you know what one might call weeds or invasive growing up all the time as well and it, it made me very much so realize the relationship of the sort of over time and leaves falling and making more earth and therefore, you know, our cities and our spaces becoming, you know, underground, you know, and, and the kind mm -hmm. of time scale of that has become really interesting. I don't know if there's anything I'm going to ever do with it, 
but that space has taught me about how our spaces can get covered with dirt so easily like basically how we can get swallowed back into the earth and sort of its kind of time and duration as well so lots of thoughts there but i i can see what you're seeing in that image especially mm -hmm. cool thanks sure Yeah, that should have been also part of my introduction, which I which could have been a lot better. Is like if I was ever trapped in the woods somewhere and had to fight a bear, you would be the person that I would. Want. <laughs> I got <gotcha. laughs> you. I'm not seeing any other questions, um, but uh, not on YouTube, not in the chat here. I want to thank you. I think it's. I think. But what often happens with these types of conversations and the lectures is that there are other conversations that occur the day after, the week after. I think we'll continue to discuss this. I think the it's recorded and captured, and so it gets shared in in classes. And uh, it's nice knowing that, well, I'll say often you're close by. There was a that period of three years where it was, hey, Katie, do you want to grab dinner? And it was you were at the barn. So That's true. Sorry about that. <laughs> but I think I think Philip's right. I think there, we have some there. Are, there are some interesting ways to be able to continue to work on these things and to follow your work and to enjoy the what I think are both kind of disciplinary questions. Even though I think you're operating on the edges of maybe the discipline and, and either pulling us in different directions, or I think there's an incredible sensitivity to your work that forces us to look at. The things that we do on a daily basis but look at it with a lot more care and a lot more um, precision maybe so thank you so much for sharing your work and spending the time with us tonight it's it's great to see you and hear you talk about these things thanks for having me a lovely um as well to speaking of the conversations that come up these questions are fantastic and and hit also at this moment where I'm working through a project that I just love. These questions have made me like, I need to go work on the hideout now. <laughs> so I'm super grateful for that. And it's so lovely to see so many of you guys too, at least virtually. Well, and then we, you also remind me too, that we have to hold up our end of the bargain that you're, you were lecturing tonight and you were hoping to stay at the Affleck house. And so we'll find a time to do that and host you there soon Perfect. enough. I like it. Thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, we have another lecture next week, right, Emily? Next, we do. Uh, next Thursday night. Yes. So thank you everybody and we'll see you soon. Good night. Just like the post-lecture hangout. <laughs>